Good afternoon, everyone. This is the lecture for class six, where we are shifting gears from our discussion of conservatism as a skeptical response to modernity uh, to conservatism as a more full-throated defense of traditionalism and natural law and, and, and traditional forms of power and morality. Uh, and we're beginning our first, kind of, our first discuss our discussion here uh, by returning back to a commentator on the French Revolution with Joseph de Meister. Um, and so if the first strain of conservative thinking that we studied attempts to turn enlightenment doubt and critique back against itself, um, so you uh, kind of showing the limits of human reason and challenging the omnipotence of human reason, uh, the second strain of conservative thinking that we'll be studying defends the existing social order and traditional authority not as pragmatic means to maintain safety and public order and social harmony, but as goods in and of themselves. So as where Burke, Hayek, and Oakeshott defend institutions as contingent developments, um, remember that none of them really say that there's like a necessary uh, necessity behind the existing social order, um, but they are contingent developments that should be defended only because the revolutionary option is worse. This unit um, the thinkers we're studying are going to be much more willing to defend these institutions as the product of natural law or divine providence. So in this line of thinking, traditional forms of authority should be defended because they are sanctioned by something beyond politics, God, reason, nature, something like that, and not just arbitrary or superstitious relic that the Enlightenment takes them to be. Uh, and so our, our thinker for this week, Joseph de Meister, opens his considerations on France with Quote, we are all attached to the throne of the supreme being by a supple chain that restrains us without enslaving us. Nothing is more admirable in the universal order of things than the action of free beings under the divine hand. So for de Meister and other conservative thinkers of this tradition, there's something bigger than politics, which restrains, or at least it should restrain, human activity. The human political institutions reflect uh, and they instantiate or bring into reality this cosmic order. Um, but they do not create order or, uh, or authority from scratch. They kind of borrow this authority from something bigger than humanity itself. Um, and so our goals for this week in our study of de Meister are to understand what he means by providence and how, prov how he takes providence to play a role in uh, political life. Um, and then more specifically, how, the French, how his account of the French Revolution fits into this account of providence. Um, and then we're gonna turn more towards his account of the divinity of constitutions or the divine foundations of the monarchy in which he argues that kind of that God wants us to restore the French monarchy against the Republic. So we're going to do a little bit of context first and then turn to his arguments about providence, providence and then his justification of a counter-revolution based on the divine sanction of the monarchy. So de Meister was born in the Duchy of Savoy, uh, which was part of the kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. Uh, which governed the island of Sardinia and what is now northwestern Italy. Uh, his family was of both French and Italian origin, and his father attained the title of Count from the King of Piedmont, Sardinia. Uh, he probably received a Jesuit education, uh, and he was, but he received a law degree in 1774 uh, at the University of Turin, Turin uh, and planned on pursuing a degree, uh, career in politics, going into public service. Um, but during the French Revolution, he fled his uh, hometown of Chambéry uh, when it was taken by the French army in 1792 and eventually ended up in Switzerland where he began writing counter-revolutionary tracts. He eventually uh, left and ended up in Cagliari where the king of Piedmont Sardinia held court in exile after the French army took Turin in 1798. Uh, from there, he eventually became a diplomat for Piedmont Sardinia, moving to St. Petersburg as the ambassador to the Russian Tsar Alexander I. Uh, but he had very few actual formal diplomatic responsibilities and spent more of his time being a socialite and writing works of political philosophy. Uh, and his journals at the time actually became some, some of the uh, source material for Tolstoy's War and Peace. After the defeat of Napoleon and the restoration of the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia, uh, Meister returned to Turin and served in the government until his death in 1821. Uh, so like Burke, he was deeply involved in the actual life of politics. He wasn't just a kind of abstract theorist uh, of politics. 
And, through, and so if we're trying to contextualize the considerations on France themselves, uh, we can look at how it fits into his thought more generally. And throughout his thinking, de Meister argued, advocates for both royalism and Catholicism uh, against Enlightenment attempts to provide rational foundations for political authority, uh, which he viewed as like, uh, like Oakshot, like Burke, as doomed to failure. Uh, for him, the, uh, like Burke and like Oakshot, these were always going to, philosoph philosophical accounts were always going to lead to unresolvable arguments and philosophical disagreements. Um, that, that you were never going to be able to satisfy everyone, um, that the, every time you tried to provide like a philosophical account, it always just created more questions than answers. And he takes this a step further, uh, and it's not just a pragmatic defense of whatever happens to exist, um, but he argues further that the monarchy is a divinely ordained institution and that religion provides the ultimate backstop to authority um, because it is beyond philosophical rationality. It can't be, you can't, it can't, it's not, you can't appeal to reason giving or philosophy. Um, you just kind of have to take it on faith and it provides this ultimate like backstop where questions stop and you have to obey. And so, so for him, the Pope actually holds ultimate authority on earth. In some earlier texts from the 1790s, um, the, the, um, including uh, letters from a Savoyard royalist in 1793 and a series of essays against Rousseau's conception of the state of nature and sovereignty that were written in between 1794 and 1795. Uh, in, in the former, it was one of his, the, his first counter-revolutionary writings uh, defending royalism. And his later essays on Rousseau de further developed his critique of the Enlightenment um, and this idea that philosophy could not provide ultimate foundations for political authority. Later in his life, uh, he would write a defense of the papacy in, in 1819 called, titled The Pope and, and a series of dialogues exploring the problem of theodicy or why bad things happen uh, in a divinely preordained world um, titled The St. Petersburg Dialogues uh, in 1821. Uh, we'll actually read one of these dialogues later in the semester uh, and we'll talk about this problem of theodicy in just a little bit because it's a similar question that he's uh, that he's interested in in these um, in the these texts. Um, if we want to contextualize the considerations in revolutionary time in the context of the French Revolution, this was published in 1797, so significantly after Burke's reflections on uh, 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 Burke's reflections on the revolution in France. Um, so this is after the regicide uh, and the reign of terror. In 1793, 1794, uh, and the expansion of the war throughout Europe. It's after the constitution of year three and the directory takes power, um, ending the power of the Jacobins and the reign of terror in 1795. And it's after the Napoleonic invasion of Italy um, and, and the kind of subduing uh, suppression of royalist uprisings in the Vendée region of France. So this is kind of a, it's all looking pretty, pretty, looking pretty bad for the cases of the royalists. Um, and so if Burke's reflections are kind of a prediction of the reign of terror, uh, De Meister's considerations are trying to fit both the violence of the reign of terror and the success of the revolutionary armies in Europe and to his general claim that God has a plan for everything and that plan includes the monarchy. So let's turn to his writings more specifically. Um, the key crucial idea in this political thought is that, in De Meister's political thought is this idea of providence and this, this basic idea that everything happens according to God's plan, that there's a divine plan and motor to history, and that everything that happens happens for a reason that is preordained by God. Uh, this is what the Meister means by that supple chain and universal order of things uh, and that opening quote that I referenced earlier. Um, and so all of our activity and all of our lives, no matter how consequential it might seem in the moment, is really just part of the outplaying of a preordained plan. So in this line of thinking, we need to rethink our, and especially the enlightenment-based ideas about free will. Uh, instead, we need to think of humans as freely slaves who, quote, act voluntarily and necessarily at the same time. They really do want what they will, but without being able to disturb the general plans. So our experience of willing, of choosing, of acting is real, um, but our, there's nothing that we could ever do that could challenge the divine order that would make us more powerful than God. Uh, as he puts it a little later on page three, if we imagine a watch, all of whose springs vary continually in strength, weight, dimension, form, and position, that nevertheless invariably keep perfect time, we will form some idea of the action of free beings relative to the plans of the creator. 
So from the divine perspective, nothing we do is novel or surprising, but is perfectly part of the divine order. So we already have a fairly stark contrast between the skeptical form of conservatism, which accepts the contingency and arbitrariness of history, but views these as reasons to maintain what exists because we don't know what will come next and it might be worse. Um, where here for the Meister, we have this idea that order and there's an order and purpose to history and that this can be used to evaluate historical and political developments. The challenge then becomes, and this is the challenge of this book, um, how do we fit the French Revolution into the divine providence? The same revolution that rejects the authority of the church, the same revolution that attempted to install reason and not revelation as the chief source of political authority. Um, the, this event seems to contradict the idea that God is directing history. Um, and so this is a political version of the problem of the Odyssey. If God is good, how can bad things happen? And so we can reframe this for this book as how can the atheistic and violent French Revolution play a role in God's divine plan? Why didn't God stop the French Revolution? Um, and, and his answer is that the revolutionaries are not really in charge, um, but the French Revolution is actually being led along by providence. He writes that in revolutionary periods, uh, individuals are carried along by an unknown force. And that's on page four. And then on page five, he writes that the most striking thing about the French Revolution is this overwhelming force that bends every obstacle. It is a whirlwind carrying along like straw everything that human force has opposed to it. No one has hindered its course with impunity. So the very success of the French Revolution for de Meister is proof that it is not simply of human origin. Um, that, that this kind of idea that, that it's that this um, that, that, that it's kind of just being driven along throughout history when, uh, without anyone able to really control it. This kind of constant succession of coups and counter coups in which the people who think they are in charge and in control of the revolution end up being overthrown years later is just kind of proof that this is not a human product. And this, for, for de Meister, providence is the only thing that can explain how something as completely improbable and terrifying from his perspective uh, could not only be successful, but also conquer and be militarily successful throughout Europe. Um, so as he, as he writes on pages, uh, uh, sorry, as he writes on the um, end of chapter one, pages seven and eight, we cannot repeat too often that men do not lead the revolution. It is the revolution that uses men. They are right when they say it goes all alone. This phrase means never has the divinity shown itself so clearly in any human event. If the vilest instruments are employed, punishment is for the sake of regeneration. So what's the point of this violence? What's the point of the revolution and the divine plan? Uh, the end of the quote on page eight points to his answer, regeneration. For de Meister, every nation, like every individual, has received a mission that it must fulfill. Everyone, every nation has a divine purpose. And for him, France's mission was to be the leader of Christian Europe, um, and Catholic Europe in particular. Um, but since, uh, he writes on page nine, she has used her influence to contradict her vocation and demoralize Europe. And here he's thinking of the philosophes, people like Rousseau, people like Diderot, uh, people, these, this, these French Enlightenment thinkers. We should not be surprised if she is brought back to her mission by parallel means. So we should think of the revolution in this framework as a punishment from God for abandoning Christianity and the divinely ordained monarchy. And as he continues on page nine, uh, he writes, all those who labored to free the people from their religious beliefs all these who willed the revolution and all who willed it have very justly, even according to our limited insight, become its victims. That is, we shouldn't be surprised that the revolution continually eats its own children, uh, that many of the revolutionaries found themselves denounced and executed as reactionaries. This is all part of the divine plan to punish those who would distract France from its Christian mission. Uh, in, in, in effect, de Meister inverts the rationalist justification of violence that we saw in Robespierre at the very beginning of the semester that violent means could be used to justify, or could be justified by uh, virtuous ends. And he writes on page 10, when the philosopher uh, justifies evil by the end in view, when he says in his heart, let there be a hundred thousand murders, provided we are free, providence replies, I accept your offer, but you will be included in the number. Where is the injustice? So this very consequentialist logic and rationality uh, it gets turned against the enlightenment itself and as part of this divine plan.
So this providential interpretation of the French Revolution relies on an implicit claim that the French Revolution will ultimately fail, leading to the rebirth of both the monarchy and the power of the church. Um, so, so why does he believe this? On the one hand, he makes appeals to history throughout chapter four. He argues that small republics have been successful, but large republics, and France, revolutionary France would here be a large republic, uh, have not. And monarchies have always existed throughout history, where republics and democracies have not. There's often periods of time without them. At one point on page 37, he calls the idea of a large republic as contradictory as a square circle. And so I encourage you to look closely at his arguments in chapter four uh, and think about whether, whether there are good reasons for why you can't have a large country governed by a democracy. But he also thinks that the revolution is inherently bad, as he writes on page 38. Now, what distinguishes the French Revolution and makes it a, an event unique in history is that it is radically bad. No element of good disturbs the eye of the observer. It is the highest degree of corruption ever known. It is pure impurity. He thinks that the moral character of France has been irrevocably corrupted by the revolution, uh, where everything vicious has become virtuous. He targets the Republican calendar, for example, as a, as a conspiracy against religion that celebrates the greatest crimes that have ever dishonored humanity. And he, here again, he's like making arguments very similar to Burke, that the revolutionary reworking of society from the ground up will be unsustainable and will always eventually collapse without something stronger without something kind of uh, traditional um, and, 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 and non-rational to anchor the social order. And this story culminates in chapters nine and 10 of the uh, considerations where he argues that both the counter-revolution is inevitable and will display the truth of the divine order of the world. And so as, as I just was talking about, he thinks that the French Revolution is an inherent contradiction, that without some sort of religious foundation to instill obedience and order, the, order these contradictions, it will lead to its downfall. He describes on pages 78 and 79 this like kind of uh, fanciful scenario where in the midst of a failing Republican regime with its econo economy collapsing, its society collapsing, its government unable to enforce order, um, that there will be a pro-monarchy faction that will emerge, which slowly spreads throughout all of France as people re realize the current regime is failing, uh, the soldiers will still want to eat and get paid, and this will culminate in a groundswell of support for the monarchy among the soldiers and the people, and that even staunch revolutionaries uh, fearing the majority turning against them will cry out, long live the king. Uh, and he describes this counter-revolution in similar language to the way he talked about the revolution, of people getting swept up in these forces that are bigger than themselves, uh, and he thinks that this is like the end of the line of inevitability, um, that the, and this is going to be the working out of the divine order. And he makes this point about Revelation explicit on page 80, where he says, it is especially in the establishment and overthrow of sovereignties that the action of providence shows itself in the most striking way. The Meister believes that the eventual overthrow of the French Republic and the restoration of the monarchy will serve as a signal that uh, quote, God wants us, that he, God warns us, sorry, that he has reserved to himself the establishment of sovereignties by never confiding to the masses the choice of their masters. And that's on page 79. Uh, in restoring the monarchy and the church, the counter-revolution completes this providential plan, having purified France of his rationalistic, atheistic, and republicanism. Uh, and it's proves that God, it's proof that through history, history becomes this proof that God favors the king and has restored the king to power despite all enemies. So we'll talk about this, why he thinks that the, there's a divine foundation to the monarchy in just a second, but if you need to take a break, this is a great time to do so. So the providential interpretation of the French Revolution in which the attempt to destroy the universal church and the monarchy will, quote, culminate in the glorification of Christianity and the monarchy. It's on page 80. Uh, relies on an unstated premise that the monarchy is a divinely ordained uh, form of government. And the question is, why does God, and not just Joseph de Meister, favor the monarchy over democracy? Why isn't democracy ordained by God? Uh, and he argues in chapter six that constitutions are not created by human beings, but are divine gifts. He gives a series of arguments beginning on page 49, um, but these ultimately boil down to the idea that the rights and laws encoded in the constitutions and political legislation and laws are nothing more than instantiation of pre-existing natural laws and natural rights. Uh, he writes on page 49 that these are declaratory statements of anterior rights 
or we can think of that these are just simply statements of affirmation of the divine law, that positive law, the laws passed by governments and legislatures, is not inventing something out of scratch, but basically saying, yes, we believe that these divine laws should bind us. Um, and he further argues that it's only by placing ourselves in harmony with God's law that we're able to participate in action at all. He writes on page 43, every time a man puts himself according to his abilities in harmony with the creator and produces any institution whatsoever in the name of the divinity, then no matter what his individual weakness, ignorance, poverty, obscurity of birth, in short, his absolute lack of ordinary human resources, he participates in some manner in the power and permanence of the divine. He produces works whose strength and permanence astonish reason. Yeah, and that is, those who act in the name of God and in accordance with the divine law are able to create, in accordance with the divine plan, strong and lasting political institutions that astonish reason. So when we put our faith in human reason, thinking that we and not God are the authors of our destiny, we inevitably fail. But this create, creates potentially a circular argument, that the existence of the monarchy is proof that it is divinely ordained, because if God didn't allow it, it wouldn't exist. Um, the existence of the French Republic is also divinely ordained as proof, um, or at least its existence and then failure is divinely ordained because it acts against God and God will cause it to fail, right? You get this kind of history can only prove one side of this argument for, for De Meister. And he also mounts a defense of Christianity uh, through a vehement critique of the anti-religious nature of the French Revolution. He writes on page 41, that there is a satanic quality to the French Revolution that distinguishes it from everything we have ever seen or anything we are ever likely to see in the future. And he's echoing arguments that we saw in the skeptical camp here um, by distinguishing institutions that are founded on religion and those founded on philosophy and reason. Um, and he says that institutions are strong and durable to the degree that they are, so to speak, deified. And this is like the similar argument that we saw in Burke about how um, it's necessary to dress up power. But he continues on page 41 that philosophy is incapable of supplying these foundations, which with equal ignorance are called superstitions, but philosophy is on the contrary an essentially disruptive force. That philosophy and philosophical questioning, critique, reason, these tear down foundations, that critique and doubt and skepticism can, can po reveal the limitations and challenges and contradictions in institutions. Um, but this doubt and skepticism in and of itself can't supply anything positive. It's only by placing these found, the foundations of these institutions beyond the realm of questioning, beyond the realm of reason, skepticism, through religion, uh, by just kind of asserting that these are divine law, that institutions can be strong and durable. And so he defends Christianity uh, specifically as having permeated all of European culture in a way that animates and sustains everything. That's on page 42. Uh, he writes that it tempers the passions and the moral life of all of Europe. Um, and he offers further proof on page 47 um, that, that uh, Christianity has survived every test from peace, war, scaffolds, triumphs, daggers, temptations, pride, humiliations, affluence, the night of the Middle Ages, and the bright daylight of the centuries of Leo X and Louis XIV. The French Revolution, then, for de Meister, is another experiment attempting to live without Christianity, which will eventually fail and lead to its restoration. That philosophy uh, and the French Revolution is a particularly effective one, um, because philosophy, having corroded uh, the cement that united men, there are no longer any moral bonds. The civil authority favoring with all its strength the overthrow of the old system gives to the enemies of Christianity all the support it once gave to Christianity itself. So in the French Revolution, in the Enlightenment, we have this kind of unity between the civil authority of politics and against Christianity, against the old system. And therefore, if the French Revolution fails to create a thriving social order, it'll be final proof of the impossibility of an atheistic, rational foundation to politics. Um, because philo uh, philosophism, as he writes on page 48, no longer has any complaints to make. All human chances are its favor. Like all for social forces have lined up in the French Revolution against religion, against Christianity, and against the monarchy. Um, and, and against all of these forms of, 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 of religious belief. Um, but in if, with all these benefits and all these allies, it's unable to establish a um, 
a coherent foundation in a, in a stable society, that's proof that it never will be able to, right? This is the best chance it has. And he thus closes chapter five. Frenchmen, make way for the very Christian king. Carry him yourselves to his ancient throne. Raise him again, on, raise again his oriflame, and let his coinage, ranging again from one pole to the other, carry everywhere the triumphant device. Christ commands, he reigns, he is the victor. And with the Meister, we are starting to see a very different version of conservatism. Rather than trying to triangulate Enlightenment skepticism against itself, it rejects such skepticism and insists on the reality of the divine order, of providence, of the truth of Christianity, of the inherent goodness of the monarchy. As the 20th century liberal political philosopher Isaiah Berlin, Berlin writes of the Meister, what really fascinates Meister is power. Power for him is divine. It is the source of all life, of all action. It is the paramount factor in the development of mankind, and whoever knows how to wield it acquires the right to use it. It is by that token the instrument chosen by God at that particular moment to work his mysterious purpose, to recognize power where it truly lies in ancient, established, socially created institutions not made by the hands of man, is political and moral insight and wisdom. All usurpation must fail in the end because it flouts the divine laws of the universe. Permanent power, therefore, resides only in him who is the instrument of such laws. To resist power is criminal childishness and folly directed against the human future. So some questions to consider. Where and how does De Meister depart from the skeptical tradition? And what aspects of this kind of Burkean line of conservatism does he retain? What are some rhetorical benefits of this appeal to divine authority and to providence? What are the drawbacks of this if we think of this text not just as a philosophical text, but as a rhetorical text? Are there aspects of De Meister's argument and writing that resonate with conservative politics or rhetoric today? What do you make of this providentialist argument that God preordained the revolution to demonstrate the ultimate triumph of Christianity? Is there a secular version of this providentialism? or? Is, there, is this a purely religious argument? So those are some questions to think about as you finish the reading and as we look towards our discussion sections this week. Um, whoops. Uh, and that is going to wrap up our uh, introductory lecture on De Meister. Um, and we, I look forward to looking at this uh, text and some of the uh, vehement and outlandish uh, rhetoric uh, that he uses in his defense of the established order, defense of the monarchy and Christianity, uh, and thinking about how this represents another way in which conservative politics are articulated that continues to the present. I'll see you at discussion sections on Monday, Wednesday. As always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, you can reach out to me via email. You can meet with me in office hours. Uh, I hope you're all doing well, and I look forward to our conversations.